Black History Month is the annual celebration of the study and achievements of African Americans. And it was birthed from a time when African Americans weren't being recognized for their central role in American history. Also known as African American History Month, it grew out of Negro History Week, which was the brainchild of black historian Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Carter G. Woodson and prominent minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. This organization was dedicated to researching and promoting the achievements of African Americans and people of African descent. Carter G. Woodson believed that blacks should know their past in order to participate intelligently in affairs of this country. And he believed that black history was a pathway for young African-Americans to build on in order to become productive members of society. This holiday, instead of giving them something nice, why not gift them somewhere nice? During the IHG Hotels and Resorts Cyber Sale, you can do just that and save. Shopping is easy in the IHG One Rewards app, where you'll save 20% on travel across 6,000 plus global destinations. And if you want to gift yourself somewhere nice, go ahead. You'll earn more and save more during the Cyber Sale. Check out all the deals at IHG.com backslash Cyber Sale. Terms apply. Welcome to One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this episode is about Black History Month and the life of Carter G. Woodson. As always, if you like this, please consider to our Patreon page. You can find us at One Mike Black History and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. In 1964, James Baldwin would talk about his education, stating that when I was in school, I began to be bugged by the teaching of American history because it seemed like that history was taught without cognizance of my presence. This idea also frustrated Carter G. Woodson almost a century before Baldwin and set in motion the beginning of Black History Month. But to understand Black History Month, we must understand more about Carter G. Woodson, also known as the father of black history. Carter G. Woodson was born in New Canton, Virginia. His parents were former slaves, Ann Eliza and James Henry Woodson. Even though his parents could not read or write, Carter's father was still very intelligent. He bestowed guiding principles on his life. When he was dealing with other people's homes, including white residents, he avoided going through back doors. James Woodson's principles put black and white folks on equal footings And even though it often meant hardship, Carter's father insisted on learning to accept insult, to compromise on principle, to mislead your fellow man or betray your people is to lose your soul. Carter would work the family's six acre farm, which was located on mostly poor land, but they were able to produce enough vegetables for their large family. His father was a Civil War veteran who learned carpentry from his father and supported his family by laying foundations to homes. Woodson was brought up without the ordinary comforts of life. His school had a five month term year, but Woodson was only able to attend on days with rain or snow when he was not needed on the farm. He still was an excellent student. And when he did show up, he often completed his assignments early. Determined not to be defeated by this setback, Carter learned mostly through self-instruction and was able to master the fundamentals of common school subjects by the time he was 17. Ambitious for more education, Carter and his brother, Robert Henry, moved to Huntington's West Virginia, where they hoped to attend Douglas High School. However, Carter was forced to earn a living mining in Fayetteville County coal fields for six years and was only able to devote a few months each year to his schooling. But by 1886, the 22-year-old Carter was able to graduate from Douglas High School. After graduation, Woodson briefly attended Bertha College in Kentucky and Lincoln University in Pennsylvania before moving back to Fayetteville County, West Virginia and teaching at a high school in Winona. 
In 1900, he returned to Huntington's, West Virginia, where he would become the principal of Douglas High School that he had only graduated from four years prior. He was finally able to receive his bachelor's of literature degree from Bertha College. And from 1903 to 1907, he was a school supervisor in the Philippines. Later, he traveled throughout Europe and Asia and studied at Sorbonne University in Paris. In 1908, he received his master's from the University of Chicago. And later in 1912, he received his Ph.D. in history from Harvard University. But the major turning point in his destiny was in 1909, when he settled down for a 10 year stint teaching in Washington. He would later state that when I arrived in Washington in 1909 to begin my research, people there laughed at me, especially because of my hayseed clothes. At that time, I didn't have enough money even for a haircut. And when I, in my poverty, had the audacity to write a book on the Negro, the scholarly people of Washington laughed at it. Woodson would earn their respect, and in the summer of 1915, Woodson received an invitation to the Negro Folklore Conference at the University of Chicago. Woodson turned the invitation down, saying with his characteristic bluntness that he was not a folklorist and that he didn't think the conference would accomplish anything. He told the organizers that he had something else taking shape in mind. This idea that was taking shape was for a national black historical society. Woodson planned to organize this scholarly association with fanfare at a national conference. He would eventually abandon that idea, saying that for reasons he didn't believe that a large number of persons would pay attention to the movement until it actually demonstrated the possibility of field work had to be made. Woodson believed in the power of real work, and for the rest of his life, he believed that actual demonstration of field work was more compelling than a ton of speeches and resolutions. So believing and saying, he asked a handful of men to join him in organizing in a corner. And this corner was the corner office at the Wabash Avenue YMCA in Chicago. On September 9th, 1915, Woodson and three others organized the Association for the Study of Negro Life. The purpose of this organization in his own words, was the collection of psychological and historical data on the Negro and the study of the people of African blood, the publishing of books in the field, and to promote the harmony between the races by equating one with the other. In the beginning, and for a long time after, the association was a complete one-man show, with Woodson producing, directing, writing, organizing, and sweeping the floor and providing most of the money. Even after the organization was launched, he would later state that few members were anxious to assume any financial responsibility and therefore urge further delay before carrying out any of the programs or demonstrations. Delay was not Carter G. Woodson's way. So on January 1st, 1916, without consulting the executive council, Woodson organized an actual demonstration, publishing at his own expense the first issue of the Journal of Negro History. This naturally enraged the council. One member even resigned in protest. Undaunted, undismayed, Carter G. Woodson would press on and the leaders of the organization would follow. Although Woodson would alienate some of his friends and supporters, he would succeed through the power of example and sheer force of his own personality in creating a structure which published books, funded researchers, taking shape in the thinking of the large masses of people. And by 1920, he had organized the Association for Negro Publishers to make possible publications, a circulation of valuable books on colored people that were not being accepted by most white publishers. Later in 1922, also serving as the dean of Howard University and West Virginia State, he would leave the teaching profession and devoted himself completely to the organization and his movement. Later, in February 7th, 1926, he would organize Negro History Week. However, Woodson never meant for black history to be confined to just a week. Woodson chose February for reasons of tradition and reform. 
It's commonly said that Woodson selected February to encompass the birthdays of two great Americans who played a prominent role in shaping black history. Those two would be Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, whose birthdays are February 12th and February 14th. But more importantly, he chose them for reasons of tradition. Since Lincoln's assassination in 1865, the black community, along with other Republicans, had been celebrating the fall and president's birthday and since the late 1890s black communities across the country had also been celebrating frederick Douglass's. well aware of those pre-existing celebrations woodson built negro history week around that tradition and commemorating black history's past he asked the public to extend their study of black history and not create a new tradition, but in doing so, he felt that it increases Negro history's weak chances for success. Yet, Woodson wanted to build on these traditions. Without simply saying as much, he aimed to reform it from the study of two great men to the study of an entire race. He admired both men, but he believed that history was made by the people, not simply Lincoln and Douglas. He envisioned the study and the celebration of Negroes as a race. And Lincoln, however great he was, had not freed the slaves. That was done by the Union Army. And in that army included hundreds of thousands of black soldiers and sailors. And they had done that. And rather than focus on just two men, the black community should focus on the countless efforts of black men and women who contributed to the advancement of the human race and African American history. From the start, Woodson was overwhelmed by the response to the week. Negro History Week appeared across the country in schools and before the public. In the 1920s was the decade of the new Negro. The name was given to the post-war generation by Alan Locke because of its rise of racial pride and consciousness. Urbanization and industrialization had migrated over a million African Americans from the rural South to large Northern cities across the nation. And the expansion of the black middle class came in participants and consumers of black literature and black culture. Black history clubs sprang up and teachers demanded materials to instruct their pupils. As Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History scrambled to meet the demand, they set a theme for the annual celebration and provided study materials, pictures, lessons for teachers, plays for historical performances, posters of important dates and people, and provided a steady flow of knowledge to high schools and progressive counties that formed Negro history clubs to serve the desire for history buffs to participate in the re-education of African Americans across the nation. The Association for the Study of Negro Life and History would form branches that stretched from one corner of the country to the other. And as black populations grew, mayors issued Negro History Week proclamations. And in cities like Syracuse, some whites joined in Negro History Week with National Brotherhood Week. Negro History Week proved to be much larger in scope than Woodson or his association could control. By the 30s, Woodson complained about intellectual frauds from both black and white popping up everywhere seeking to take advantage of the public's new interest in black history. He warned teachers not to invite speakers who sometimes had less knowledge than the students themselves. Increasingly, publishing houses who had previously ignored black subjects and black authors rushed to put books on the markets and in schools and suddenly Experts were everywhere. Non-scholarly works appeared from mushroom presses. In America, nothing popular escapes either commercialization or eventual trivialization. So Woodson, the constant reformer, had his hands full in promoting a celebration worthy and the actual history of the people who made that history possible. Woodson believed that Negro History Week celebrations, but not the study or the celebration of black history, would eventually come to an end. In fact, he never viewed black history as a one week affair. He pressed schools to use Negro History Week to demonstrate what students could learn all year long. And in that same vein, he established black study programs that would reach adults throughout the year. 
It was this sense that blacks would learn from their past on a daily basis and they could look forward to a time of annual celebration was no longer necessary. By the 40s, efforts began within the black community to attempt to expand the study of black history in schools and black history celebrations before the publics. In the South, black teachers often taught black history as a supplement to American history. And one student during the 40s reported that his teacher would hide Woodson's textbooks underneath her desk to avoid drawing the wrath of the school's principal. During the civil rights movement in the South, freedom schools, which were temporary alternative schools for African-Americans, originally part of a nationwide effort during the civil rights movement to organize African-Americans to achieve social and political equality. These schools incorporated black history in their curriculum to advance social change. The Negro history movement was an intellectual insurgency, which was a part of a larger effort to transform race relations in the United States. Even before the 60s were over, Negro History Week will be well on its way to becoming Black History Month. The shift to a month-long celebration began even before Carter G. Woodson's death in April 3, 1950. As early as the 40s, Blacks in West Virginia, a state which Woodson often spoke, began to celebrate February as Negro History Month. And in Chicago, cultural activist Frederick H. Hammurabi started celebrating Negro History Month in the mid-60s. Hammurabi used his cultural center, the House of Knowledge, to infuse African consciousness with the study of black history. Also in the 60s, most textbooks for the eighth grade U.S. history classes only mentioned two African Americans for the entire century of history that had transpired since the Civil War. That was a problem that could no longer be ignored. And it was in that decade that young blacks and college campuses became increasingly conscious to their links to Africa. And Black History Month was replacing Negro History Week at an increasingly quickening pace. In 1976, 50 years after the first celebration of Negro History Week, President Gerald Ford would officially recognize Black History Month during the celebration of the United States Bicentennial. During the decades leading up to Black History Month being recognized, there was an institutionalized shift away from a week to a month and away from Negro history to Black history. Ten years later, in 1986, which would also be the first celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday as a natural holiday, U.S. Congress, in a joint resolution with the House and Senate, designated the month of February as National Black History Month. The resolution authorized and requested the President Ronald Reagan to issue a proclamation of observance. And in 1986, the Presidential Proclamation 5444 noted that the foremost purpose of Black History Month is to make all Americans aware of the struggle for freedom and equal opportunity. Since its early beginnings in 1926, Negro History Week and later Black History Month would spark a discussion of the celebration of black history and the contributions of African Americans all year long. As Gerald Ford would state during the first iteration of Black History Month, in this celebration of black history, we seize this opportunity to honor too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of an endeavor throughout our history. This has been One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this was the story of Black History Month. Once again, if you like this, please join us at onemikeblackhistory.com. You can support us on Patreon, and please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Peace.